Science. Engineering. Medicine. Yes, chemistry. Physics. Biology. Humanities. Cardiology. Computer. Public health. Global. Science. Communication. Hello, everyone. I'm Gareth Mitchell. Welcome back. I hope you're well. AI and health inequalities are on the menu today. Also, the mysterious and rare inflammatory condition that appeared in some children around the beginning of the pandemic. And staying on health, we also have advice about safeguarding your own wellness and that of the planet. Here's just one of the many things you can do. Being a more conscious consumer, so we know that consuming more and the obsession, if you like, with physical things is often not actually very good for our, our mental health and well-being and actually is also not very good for the climate as well in terms of producing lots of stuff. The Imperial College Podcast. Well, first we'll look at a few happenings from around the college and to start with a media appearance, quite a prominent one. Now, you might remember that in our last edition, we spoke to Robin Shattuck about his appearance on BBC One's Question Time. He was talking about vaccinations. This time round, another of our researchers has been talking about the situation in Ukraine and specifically the nuclear risks associated with that. Ryan O'Hare, can you tell me a bit more about this? Because I know you fixed it all up, didn't you? So tell me more. Hi, Gareth. Yeah, that's right. So we had Professor Jerry Thomas, um, who is our chair in molecular pathology and also the director of the Chernobyl Tissue Bank as well. She was interviewed as part of a Channel 4 documentary, uh, which posed the question, what if Putin goes nuclear? What was the background to all this? So the conflict in Ukraine has increased fears of a potential nuclear incident. We'll all be aware that Chernobyl was recently in the headlines again following fighting around the site. But there were also military strikes by Russian forces at an active nuclear power plant in the southeast of the country. And all of this, unfortunately, comes amidst the backdrop of Vladimir Putin ordering Russians deterrence forces, uh, which includes the country's nuclear weapons, to be on special alert. So raising the grim spectre of uh, nuclear war. So as for Professor Thomas, what was discussed on the programme, on the documentary? Professor Thomas highlighted how there's essentially four key aspects of these weapons that can affect human health. Uh, First, as we'd expect, there's the initial blast, which can cause direct injuries to people, buildings to collapse, etc. Next is thermal radiation from the weapon, which she described as effectively a fireball, which can cause uh, severe burns to the skin. Then in terms of radiation, she explains that with large size weapons, the radiation doesn't actually add hugely to the consequences for people in the blast radius, as most of those, unfortunately, who would have had very high doses of radiation would likely die from uh, the blast and thermal burns. But finally, there is the radioactive fallout where some of the radioactive dust can be taken up into the atmosphere and spread uh, for many miles via air currents. As well as that, Jerry Thomas was asked about what we've learned from the Chernobyl accident as well. Yes, so Professor Thomas highlighted just how much the reality of these accidents differs from our expectations. Uh, She said that many people were actually very surprised by what we learned from Chernobyl. Most people may have expected large numbers of cancers and deaths from high doses of radiation, but this didn't really materialise. She went on to say only a small number of people actually died from high doses of radiation, and these were um, largely restricted to emergency teams who reached the site quickly after the fire broke out. And of course, we've spoken to Professor Thomas a number of times on this very podcast about nuclear accidents at uh, Chernobyl in Ukraine and indeed Fukushima in Japan. Finally, where can people see this documentary? So people can see the full documentary and the full interview with Professor Jerry Thomas on What If Putin Goes Nuclear, which is available on Channel 4. All right, Ryan, thank you very much. We'll leave it there. That's Ryan O'Hare. Well, now joining us on the podcast for the first time ever, actually, is Stephen Johns. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. As Stephen is with Communications. And we're going to be talking about the ERC Grant Awardees. Very prestigious. Tell me more. So the ERC is the uh, European Research Council, which is a, a massive funding body in Europe. They've awarded free academics at Imperial Consolidator Grants worth €6 million in total. And these are sort of uh, awarded to scientists with a a track record and an excellent research proposal. Generally, the projects last up to five years. 
these are really like prestigious grants and some like the most competitive grants there are in science. It's sort of like the football equivalent of the Champions League. They're really, really hard to win. So it's excellent that Imperial have won three of them this time round. Well done, Imperial. Congratulations, us. I see that one of the awardees, for instance, was uh, Mirko Kovac, well known for his drones research. I've interviewed him a number of times as well. So tell me about that award. Yes, yeah, so, so this project is called Proteus Drone, which is named after the uh, Greek shape-shifting sea god Proteus. And Mirko's working on drones that are, will sort of have capability not only in air, but on the surface of water and in the water as well. The idea is that these drones will be able to be used in challenging environments, uh, such as the Arctic, uh, where they can study climate change. Marvellous. What about the other grant awardees? Step me through one or two of the others. So Artem Bakalin from Chemistry. So he's using lasers to better understand how material structure changes with time. So this is in uh, materials such as um, next generation solar cells and microchips. And there's one grant awardee that I'm especially interested in because this is from the Department of Electrical and Electronic Engineering. And that's my old department. I did my degree there, so I'm very close to that one. Um, So this project is looking at enabling more efficient communications between intelligent agents. You know, if you think of AI assistants such as uh, Amazon's Alexa or autonomous cars, this is basically communicating between different sensors that make decisions autonomously. So, you know, the AI in cars, for example, is always like observing its environment and then making decisions based on what the car should do. And this is sort of enabling better communications between the various different agents that are you know, carrying out these decisions. Wonderful stuff. And so just finally, on your news piece on the Imperial College website, there are some great photos, including, of course, the president of the European Research Council, who's visited campus, which A, is brilliant, given such a high profile person coming along, and B, isn't it wonderful to be able to welcome people to the campus, visitors in real life, and not on a Zoom link or whatever. Great on both levels. Yes, it was great. And um, she met some of our previous ERC winners to you know, discover the impact that these grants are sort of having on society and, and science. And there we'll leave it. Stephen Johns, thank you very much indeed. Well, we're going to talk about the benefits of artificial intelligence now, although specifically how it doesn't always benefit everyone. Here's Justine. Hi, I'm Justine Orford, and I'm here with colleagues at the Institute of Global Health Innovation, Syra Gafur, Nikki O'Brien, and Johnny Clark, to chat about their new white paper, which is on artificial intelligence in healthcare and harnessing its potential to reduce inequities. So maybe we could just start by going to a little bit of background and talking about how AI is actually being applied in healthcare. So Johnny, could you tell us a bit more? AI is not really widespread in its use in healthcare yet, but it's changing pretty quickly. And some prominent examples of that are in in its application to essentially image recognition tasks. So things like using machine learning to identify abnormalities in x-rays or in histopathology tissue images or in retinal photographs. But it's likely that in the years to come, AI will play a role in pretty much every aspect of healthcare. Thinking about the focus of your specific white paper, what are the potential sources of bias in AI and how might these disproportionately affect ethnic minority communities? Much of the discussion in the published literature to date is around the fairness of algorithms themselves. Most algorithms intend to get things right most often when applied to the whole population. And so this raises issues when there's a group that are a minority within that population. These issues are are not obvious unless researchers and clinicians actively look for them. Secondly, these models are are only based on the data they're fed. And it's clear that there are significant ethnicity-based disparities within health and healthcare in the UK. And in many cases, the cause of these disparities result from unequal access to healthcare and treatment. And if we use data that reflects these existing and historic inequalities, the models that we produce are just going to perpetuate those same inequalities unless we're careful. Yeah, it's really interesting and and obviously a very current topic right now with the pandemic having highlighted inequities with COVID-19, the virus having a worse impact on minority ethnic communities. So, Nikki, if we could go to you, how does your latest work fit in with other initiatives to address this issue? It became pretty clear early on in the pandemic that COVID-19 was having a particularly bad impact on some groups, including some ethnic minority groups, in terms of things like infection rates, hospitalizations and deaths. And, And we noted these challenges in our report and how these inequalities are in part based on wider conditions and experiences within society and within health 
and healthcare in the UK. The initial COVID-19 data response was slow to detect these issues due to the analysis being based on aggregates of the overall population, which masked the poor outcomes for minority subsets in the data. Again, this issue stemmed from wider long-standing inequities in the health data landscape. Thank you, Nikki. And so, Syra, maybe if you could just walk me through your latest paper. How did you carry out the research and what did you find? Part of the reason that we carried out this research was to really look at what's already been done out there and try and synthesise it and really kind of frame it in a UK-based setting. We also went on to speak to a range of different experts and they came from academia, from ethnicity-based research from the third sector, charitable sector, policymakers and representatives from government as well. So really to get a full varied opinion of what people are thinking in terms of what needs to happen to move forward. We then consequently held a roundtable to kind of have all those voices together and that was really to help synthesise again those opinions to see where there was definite correlation between different groups and certainly where we felt that further research needed to be conducted. Just thinking about the implications of your findings. What recommendations did you make in your white paper to address the challenges that you highlighted? One of the main issues coming across from all of this is that there needs to be a lot more funding and there needs to be a lot more research in each of the different topic areas. And it goes back to why is this happened? Who is it affecting? How can we really push that dial forward? We always talk about it, but what needs to happen in terms of that research to really make a difference and impact minority ethnic communities? Because at the moment there's lots of promise, but not really that movement in terms of actually using utilising it, but given the amount of data that we have in the UK and certainly within the NHS and once we're better at connecting the dots and utilising it in a really brilliant way, the opportunities are endless, but we need to make sure that it's equitable for everyone. But some really interesting things going on in terms of the policy landscape, certainly after the levelling up white paper was released last month, the Secretary of State for Health has announced two reviews into inequities. There was also the one on medical devices and certainly from the kind of top down level, there's that commitment to looking at some of these inequities and certainly what we can do from both policy perspective, but also kind of pushing the research agenda forward as well. So what's next for your team, Nikki? So we're in the process of developing an updated white paper on the health data landscape in the UK, which will highlight lessons in data-focused inequities identified through the COVID pandemic and the steps taken to address them, as well as ongoing challenges with the health data infrastructure in the UK. We're also soon to begin a smaller project exploring the use of health data in low and middle income countries, as there is potential for health data to improve access and utilisation towards enabling universal health coverage. But it's really crucial in this case to consider the barriers for some population groups as early as possible to avoid exacerbating existing inequalities. In conversation with Justine Alford, you just heard Nikki O'Brien, Syra Gaffur and Johnny Clark. And there's more on our news website via imperial.ac.uk slash news. And there's a link to the full report there too. Well, early in the COVID-19 pandemic, one of the more puzzling stories was the emergence of a rare inflammatory syndrome in children. By June 2020, researchers had identified it as paediatric inflammatory multi-system syndrome temporarily associated with SARS-CoV-2. Now, one of those investigating was Dr Elizabeth Whitaker of the Department of Infectious Disease at Imperial, also a consultant in paediatric infectious diseases and immunology at Imperial College Health. Care NHS Trust. Similarities emerged between the syndrome and another rare inflammatory condition called Kawasaki disease. Genevieve Timmins has been hearing more from Liz Whitaker about how they were able to characterise the condition. In April 2020, we were busy actually helping out our adult colleagues, working on adult intensive care units and paediatric wards were largely quite empty, actually. And we started to see some children coming in very unwell and they were presenting a little bit like Kawasaki. So with fevers and rashes and red eyes and lips and sometimes tummy pain, but they were older than the typical child with Kawasaki. They also could have been presenting with something called toxic shock syndrome, which also presents in this way, but they didn't quite fit with either. We had a couple of cases at Mary's and um, colleagues at the Evelina and at Great Ormond Street had also had a couple of cases and we just were good friends so we had a conversation said have you seen any of these really unusual cases 
and they were all COVID negative, um, PCR negative. And we were kind of wondering if uh, there was some other bug that was around, but they were quite geographically diverse. So we kind of reached out to other colleagues in intensive cares nationally who said yes. And we identified that within one week in April, there were 17 or 18 cases. We asked everyone to give us information about how these children had presented and their blood test results, their biochemical parameters. We sat down and went through every single case to look for similarities and differences. To create the paper that we published in JAMA, we gathered a cohort of 58 children in the UK and just prepared tables showing how they presented and coming up with comparisons with Kawasaki and toxic shock, which are kind of similar but cousin-like conditions, to show that this really was a distinct and different condition. And we called it PIMS, which is Paediatric Inflammatory Multisystem Syndrome, and the Americans called it Multisystem Inflammatory Syndrome in Children, or MIS-C. Probably Britain is a, an outlier calling it PIMS now. <laughs> Everywhere else calls it MIS-C. So moving forward slightly, in June 2021, you looked at a larger cohort of around 600 children diagnosed with the condition, and this helped to identify some effective treatments, in particular yeah. a type of steroid. Yeah, because this is like Kawasaki um, and these children were very inflamed and were really keen to turn off the inflammation of these children to help them get better. And because it was so similar, we used the same treatments we use for Kawasaki and toxic shock syndrome. So that's either intravenous immunoglobulin or corticosteroids. And then for those who didn't respond to those treatments, we used a variety of what's known as biologic treatments. This is where you have an antibody to a specific part, a synthetically made antibody to a specific part of the immune response. So the best available treatment study or BATS was a massive multinational observational study. We looked at um, how they presented, what treatments they were given, what their outcomes were like, with the aim of trying to see which of these treatments were working best. What we found is that actually all the treatments work, which is really good news. In particular, from our perspective as global health researchers, is that steroids work. Steroids are super cheap because they've been around for such a long time. So having a cheap version for children in low resource settings that we've shown to be effective has been a really important outcome of that study. And more recently, I think you've looked at risk factors underlying why some children might end up being admitted to paediatric intensive care units or sadly dying with PIMS and COVID. So if you could summarise perhaps what are some of the key things that we know now about this inflammatory condition that we didn't when it was first identified? I think what we know now is that the later children present, the more likely they are to have a, a, a severe outcome. What we try to do is ensure good education amongst primary care and secondary care providers to say if a child's had COVID within the last six weeks and they come in with unusual fevers to have a low threshold for looking for this condition. Uh, we recognise that if you give treatment early you stop the inflammatory process and therefore you decrease the risk of being admitted to intensive care. Actually in the UK we've had remarkably few deaths thankfully. Now that we know what it is we have really good critical care support and accident and emergency support in this country we very rarely see deaths. At Imperial we are um, collaborators on a National Institute of Health in the US funded trial called PREVAIL. The PREVAIL a study is looking at diagnostic and prognostic indicators and really excitingly we have identified a unique uh, transcriptomic signature. So that's how your immune system is activated at a very cellular level. We can identify very clearly a very distinct signature for those children with PIMS in comparison to other febrile conditions. We're we're validating that at the moment with samples both from UK, Europe and the US, but it could translate into a point of care test. And although we know a lot more about this condition, it's actually still quite difficult to distinguish as a frontline clinician working in A&E because children come in with fevers all the time and there are lots of things that can present with a fever. So it's, it's a clinical mystery and having a diagnostic test would be really useful. Elizabeth Whitaker talking there to Genevieve Timmins. Well, finally, want a healthy planet and a healthy you? Yeah, well, of course you do. Well, for a start, walk and cycle more if you can. Get some potted plants and try growing your own food. Those are just a few tips on being greener 
and healthier. But there's more where that came from. In fact, nine tips in total. The advice is up on Imperial Stories, along with a fun computer game style video and a whole load of useful information. Hayley Dunning has been finding out more from Gareth Thompson, a clinician at Imperial College Healthcare, currently working with the Trust to develop its new green plan. But Hayley began by talking to Neil Jennings of the Grantham Institute about the link between the climate and our health. There's a report which came out about a month ago from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and they kind of highlight the impact that climate change is having and will continue to have on our both our physical health and also on our, our mental health as well. So for example in a warmer climate we are seeing greater impacts of things like heat stress and extreme weather events such as flooding can have negative impacts both on people's physical health but also the kind of trauma that people having an experience of climate impacts can have on their on their well-being. So that's the kind of bad news uh, and I guess the good news is that because climate and health are so interlinked there's also a large number of areas where stuff that's good for tackling climate change can also really significantly benefit our health as well um, and, and vice versa. So why did you put the resource together? We kind of recognise that there's this really strong synergy between action on climate change and, and on health. And we were lucky enough to be able to partner with a bunch of health related organisations, including Imperial College NHS Trust, the Institute for Global Health Innovation and the UK Health Alliance. And that helped us to kind of bring together a really wide range of expertise from across the health professions, together with climate expertise to kind of try and pull out where are these strong synergies between, between things that we can do that can improve our health and can, can help to improve the health of the planet at the same time. And I guess the reason we brought this together is that we recognise a lot of people are concerned about their health and also about the health of the planet at the moment and are looking for things they can actually practically do in their day-to-day -day lives. So what are some of the nine things? So our number one action is to um, use your voice within the community, so to encourage your elected officials to make changes that make it easy for you to walk or cycle more, for example. We also encourage trying to make your home easier to heat through things like insulation and using draft excluders, and that can have really good benefits for your physical and mental health. Shifting towards a more plant-based diet. So we know that diets that are high in meat can be associated with higher levels of certain forms of cancer and also heart disease. Getting out into nature and bringing nature into your home. So getting involved with gardening and going visit green spaces outside your home. Being a more conscious consumer. So we know that consuming more and the obsession, if you like, with physical things is often not actually very good for our, our mental health and well-being. And actually is also not very good for the climate as well in terms of producing lots of stuff. I don't know, Gareth, do you want to elaborate on that? Because that's something you're, you're passionate about. Yeah, there's some really good research that shows that people gain actually longer and better boosts in happiness levels from shared experiences than they do from big purchases. So they looked at people that were buying new cars and they compared it to people that went away on holiday with their friends. And they found that people both predicted that they would be happier by buying a new car, but they were actually wrong when the, when the researchers followed them up. So you want to spend your money on things, spend it on experiences, not things. And that actually helps the environment and your mental well-being. It's really interesting that there's research to prove that an expansion there one of the nine things. Uh, Neil, did we miss any of them? What else of the nine things have we got? So, yeah, there's a couple more just to mention. So one is around how we adapt to a warming climate. So we know that climate change is here now and is doing things like increasing temperatures and increasing the, the risk of extreme weather events such as flooding. So it's important that we are as prepared as we can be for some of those impacts. So there's things we can do in terms of registering, for example, the Environment Agency has a, a flood hotline and you can register for free to get a notification on your phone if there's a risk of a flood in your area. And obviously by being prepared, we can then reduce the risks and the impacts that has upon our physical and mental health. And the last of our nine things is a really important one is, is around talking to others. It's a fair old challenge that we, we face ahead of us to tackle these environmental issues. And the best way we can approach this is by sharing our experiences with others and learning from others as well. So, Gareth, you're looking to maybe bring this into practice somehow. How might this be used in a healthcare setting? We also focused on the ninth item, which is talk to others. This is really powerful for us because at the Trust, we're setting up a green community network of our staff to enable our staff to take action on, on environmental issues in their place of work, delivering greener care patients and the environment and the wider community benefits from that. We're setting up that community network in order to have staff as advocates for the environment. What are the main aims of this group? What are you hoping to raise awareness of especially? One of the things that we're really focused on, and this connects to the hospital green plan as well, 
is how do we make climate change and environmental issues meaningful for our staff? How do we empower them and motivate them instead of, you know, a more punitive approach that's been taken by the environmental movement before? You can imagine being a naughty child and leaving your lights on and you get told you've got to turn the lights off, you've got to save the planet. But how can we put that and spin it the other way around and say, what are the positive benefits here? We say that human health is the face of climate change. So if we start to tackle climate change and reduce, for example, fossil fuel use in the delivery of healthcare, then we get a spin-off benefit immediately of reduced air pollution. And if there's reduced air pollution, then kids with asthma in the neighbourhood suffer from less frequent asthma attacks. So you immediately get these spin-off effects from tackling climate change, but you get them today, you don't get them in the future, you get them right now, right here. This will really be a powerful motivator for our staff because our staff care about human health and healthcare. And so by making it very clear that if we take care of the environment, we're also taking care of our own health. It's a great way to motivate people and empower them to take action. Gareth Thompson and Neil Jennings talking there to Hayley. You can read about all nine tips and a load of other useful stuff on the Imperial Stories section of our website via imperial.ac.uk slash stories. Also, there's a leaflet and that fun two-minute video. Well worth a watch. And that's nearly it for today. Over so soon, you may ask. You mean the pod isn't long enough for you? Or is it too long? Or are the items just not varied enough? Or too varied? Is the overall tone somewhere in that Goldilocks zone of not too formal, not too informal? Do you like the news section? Well, we really want to know. We're seeking your feedback. What have been some of your favourite podcasts? Do you listen on the morning commute or when kicking back with a nice cup of tea? Do take five minutes to fill out our listener survey and you'll have the chance to enter a prize draw for £50 worth of shopping vouchers. Just search for Imperial College Podcast to find us and then you can click on that listener survey right at the top. The questionnaire closes at 10am on Friday the 29th of April and with it, that chance to win the 50 quid shopping voucher. Don't miss out. So once more, just search for Imperial College Podcast and the internet will take you to our survey. All right, thanks very much, folks. That'll do for now. Until the next one, anyway, see you in April. Bye-bye.